Hi, I'm Carl Harvaldo, and with me here is Professor Jim Nehus. Hi, Jim. Hello. How are you doing, Carl? I'm doing great. How about you? So, all right. We're going to be talking about a squash that you bred. Yep. And a uh, really interesting one, a ghostly white <laughs> butternut squash. Uh, I remember <laughs> you told this story at the beginning when I was taking your plant breeding 501 class. And now we have a conclusion for this story. So let's go back to the beginning. What did All right. you find in a field? Well, let me tell you the story quickly, Carol. Mm -hmm. I, there are, you know, there are several different species of squash. You know, there are like five that are actually domesticated of the, of the 20 cucurbitas out there. And there are white rind squash in cucurbita pepo, mm -hmm. right? And they're given cute little names for Halloween, you know, they're called mm -hmm. baby boo, you know, and white something or other. And, and I was at a bean meeting about mm -hmm. 10 years ago. The bean people get together every year, every, every two years. And they held the bean meeting in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And in Puerto Rico, there's they grow a squash. They grow Cucurbita moschata. Mm -hmm. The reason they grow it there because that's of the species. That's the one that's best adapted to the lowland tropics. And so they they have a breeder there, a squash breeder. Mm -hmm. So heaven. So we're going to pass up that opportunity. And so I went to visit her, Linda Beaver, and we're walking through her field, and she has, you know, cross. It's cross pollinated crop. It's like corn. It's like your friend corn. And I thought. I know, you know, this is so interesting, and we're out in the field, and all of a sudden, the first thing I notice is, all of a sudden, I notice a bright yellow squash. Mm -hmm. And I said to the breeder, Linda Beaver, I said, oh my gosh, that's, uh, I said, I've never seen anything quite that color in this particular species. Machata tends to be mottled, sort mm -hmm. of mottled color, so it doesn't really have those clear, distinct, like oranges and yellows, right? That sort of thing. And uh, she said, "Oh, well, that's a wonderful squash." She said, "Here, I'll tell you what. I'll give you some seed, and you can cross it." And I said, "Oh, that's great." So my particular, my my particular favorite variety of the butternut is the butternut squash. Right? Mm -hmm. The cucurbita machata mm -hmm. is the butternut squash. Yeah. And butternut squash usually has a rind. This is not a butternut squash. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if I could get a butternut squash like that, I would be. I could retire. Yeah. Right. But butternut squash has this sort of brown, sort of you know dull, yeah, right, brine color, which I find kind of orange, unattractive. Orange, little pinkish. And I thought, you know, if I could make that bright yellow mm -hmm. to contrast with almost the orange of your shirt, mm -hmm. I thought, wouldn't that be pretty? Mm -hmm. Right. It has no. Uh, economic or consumer value other than being slightly prettier. But okay. let's not devalue that because if the if the food looks interesting, it catches your attention. And you really want, you know, produce to catch people's attention rather than, you know, bags of chips and sodas. Exactly. And then <laughs> hopefully a hopefully a white rind squash is better. Now here's what happens. Yeah. I make this cross, I grow out the you know the F1 then I grow out a large F2 population, and large is not, you've got to remember that the plants themselves are fairly large. Mm -hmm. When we're dealing with population genetics in squash, you have to be, you have to show restraint, mm -hmm. because each plant occupies, you know, the, an area of this room. Yeah. You grow a hundred. Just plants. imagine growing a squash plant in your garden and then growing a hundred of those, how much space that takes. Right, and it would take, so to grow out a large population, would require two acres. And since, and since my funding for this particular project was absolutely <laughs> zero, I couldn't afford to have people out there hoeing. Anyway, I grew up a kind of a small F2 population. I think we grew about actually 30 plants. Sorry to say, mm. this is really sad for you to hear that. <laughs> An F2 of only 30 popular. And one of the squash, they were yellow. They didn't seg they segregated for everything. If mm -hmm. you want to, if you want to have, if you want to feel like you are Claude Monet mm -hmm. and just love every possible variation yeah. of color, grow out a squash F2. All kinds it will of different combinations. Every <laughs> different possible combination. One of them segregates out white. And I'm out there with the graduate student. Right, one of my 
one of my graduate students, and I said, wow, I said, that looks really cool, we're going to keep that, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're busy during the summer, right? Oh, yeah. And he forgot to harvest it. Oh. And so he <laughs> came to my office, you know, totally dejected, and he said, Jim, I want to, I want to, I got to tell you a secret, you know, I'm really, I'm really embarrassed to tell you that I forgot, you know, to, to sell pollinate and harvest seed from that squash. He said, it's probably lost forever because only one out of 30 fruit, right, out of, out of, out of 30 plants actually produced a white fruit. So I said, Calvin, remember your hardy white bird? I said, now, let's, I said, let's assume that only one, let's assume that the population was 25, mm -hmm. and we had one plant out of 25 that had, let's assume that it's a single recessive gene that's resulting in white rind color, which actually later was proven to be correct, mm -hmm. right? I said, let's assume there's a little, there's a gene there called little w, little w, right? And that this fruit had little w, little w, and because we didn't harvest it, we've now lost it completely. I said, however, if one out of 25 has that, that's the frequency of P squared of for this of particular two gene. Alleles in one individual, right? And you can find it in other individuals. In so population. I said to him, if if P squared is 0 0.4, the square root of 0 0.4 is 0 0.2. I said, so the gene frequency is 0.2. In addition, I said, where do most rare alleles exist in Hardy-Weinberg, in populations in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Heterozygotes. Heterozygous form. So what would be, t what would be, the heterozygotes would be 2PQ, right? Q squared plus 2PQ plus B squared, right? So I said, actually, that gene is in, let's see, 0 0.2 times 0 0.8, 16 times 2, Almost a third of the population, yeah. I said, is carrying the allele. Now I remember when when you first told yeah. this story in class. You know, Did I change it? <laughs> no, 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 exactly. So uh, I uh, so I remember when you first told the story in class. You know, you said you found this squash, and but you knew the genes were in the pop in, there in the population, and you were like, well, it is. It's there, and we can get it back out of the population just by growing out more of these plants, crossing together, exactly. random mating, and then you'll get it again. You'll get the uh, the two two p squared. And then I remember uh, thinking, oh, that's a that's a really cool story, just showing how you know these traits are in the population, and how using a basic concept called hardy weinberg equilibrium, you would know it's not lost forever. Then I remember saying, well, that's Jim's ghost. He's chasing a ghost in the population, and but you know we hadn't hadn't seen that nobody saw this. Uh, the one little photo maybe I think you had or yeah, something, yeah. and and but you know could have been a ghost. You never know. Chasing but, the ghost. I'm gonna have to. That's a kind of a romantic way of describing Hardy yeah. Weinberg. You're chasing a ghost in the in the population. And the ghost is hidden in the heterozygotes. And and it's hidden. Yeah. But then all you had to do is just do a little bit of science, a little bit more breeding, and. Then you found it. So if you didn't know Hardy Weinberg, you would have panicked. Mm -hmm. But I did not panic or even reprimand my graduate <laughs> because I said, look, it's 2PQ. It's out there in the population. We'll recover it the next generation. No problem. And indeed we did. Mm -hmm. And we not only recovered it, we made ourselves a white rind squash. Now, we don't call it the ghost squash. Actually, That's too bad. Although I do like that name. <laughs> we call it the, the yellow one. I, you know, there's nothing more fun in Lamberty than naming your new mm -hmm. variety, right? So the traditional variety, which looks like this, right, is called butternut. Because mm -hmm. right? it's got a nutty color. Mm -hmm. The yellow one, I already picked the name out. I was going to call it butter gold. Mm -hmm. But of course, the yellow didn't segregate out. The white segregated out. So we called this buttermilk. But, Carol, I'm going with your idea. <laughs> it's going to be called... Let's see, butter ghost. Does that work? Ghost squash. Ghost squash. Ghost. Butter. Well, I mean, you see, it doesn't suggest butternut. Ghost. ghost Maybe pie. an idea. You need to, you know, get, get people thinking. You know, how fantastic this squash could be. Okay. You well, because we'll you know what? It, we'll leave it up to your plant breeding students to name this variety. Yeah. There we go. Um, 
give us some name ideas for this, because uh, you know what, actually uh, last year when you let me have a couple of these squashes from your field, I carved one up and upside down, it, it looks pretty scary carved up as a ghost, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> Alright, well thank you Carol. Yeah, and I thank you uh, That's a story Jim. of Hardy Weinberg as applied to the ghost squash. Thank you very much Yeah, Carol. thank you Jim. <laughs>